Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I created this podcast on Chernobyl just so you can kind of get a sense of, of more of Chernobyl Heart. I'm assuming you've watched Chernobyl Heart by now and that you've watched the PBS NewsHour uh, where they talked about that. Um, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of sense of where Chernobyl is right now and some more pictures that might bring this more to life. As you know, the accident happened in 1986. They filmed Chernobyl Heart in 2003, so it's 10 years old, all right? Um, so you might want to know a little bit of what's happened since then. But first, let me give you some pictures of uh, the, the Chernobyl power plant. This is after it blew up, or pieces of it after it blew up. The unit that blew up was Unit 4. Unit 1 and 2 were over here. Uh, they hadn't constructed 5 and 6 when this picture was taken. They eventually did work on 5 and 6, but anyway. Um, this is the part this is the part that blew up all right right there that this part should look slightly familiar right this is looking at it from the top and it blew the top off of this thing when it actually exploded and that's where they were pouring in concrete pouring in water pouring in liquid nitrogen pouring in whatever they could pour in to try and get the fire to stop right now this is what the thing looks like today uh, you'll notice it's very grainy picture well part of that is because of the the radiation um, but this is the sarcophagus that they built to hold in the radiation um, that is at the power plant right now. Now the interesting thing here, you never saw one of these in the video, but it's useful to know where this is. Um, the power plant was right here, the Chernobyl plant was right here, Pripyat is just barely next to it, a little bit below it. Um, and this is in Ukraine, you'll notice it's on the southern border of the northern border of Ukraine to the southern border of Belarus. So Chernobyl, when it blew, you'll notice all this purple up here and this purple way up here, right? That is the worst, uh, the, the worst devastation that happened. And you'll notice we've got a bunch of areas that are closed, even up here. And, and we have uh, permanent control zones where uh, there is so much radiation you really can't live, right? So you heard a lot of different um, different places they were talking about, and a lot of them are in Belarus. The capital of Belarus is Minsk, and that's a huge city uh, on the order of New York. It's a little bit smaller than New York, but it's it's a huge city. That's their capital. Um, so there is lots of um, radiation up there. You heard in the video, you heard about the Gomel region. They talked about uh, the Gomel region. That's right here, uh, where they were at um, different mental asylums, etc. All right. I don't see any of the other cities they mentioned immediately off the top of my head. Right? But look at where the radioactive fallout was. It went all over the place. And so it was taken by the wind all the way up into Sweden and Norway and Finland, way up, way up north. Right? And that's the cesium-137 that can be found all over uh, based on this. So when we look at where this actually happened, it may have happened in the Ukraine, it happened down here, right? But the all of this radiation went all the way up to Sweden. It went into Russia, went into Belarus. Ukraine didn't get a whole lot, okay, from this. Uh, again, here's Minsk in um, in Belarus. We had the Gomel region, which was over here, and the actual uh, explosion happened down here, in uh, actually more like there, okay. So just to kind of give you a sense of where the problem lies, okay? What actually happened? Well, the operating crew, you, you didn't hear a lot of this in the video. What you saw in the video was the remnants of what happened and how it affected the people. But the actual event, the operating crew planned to test whether the turbines could produce sufficient energy to keep the coolant pumps running in the event of a loss of power. So, of course, they were testing this in the middle of the night because there's less demand on the system. So in order to prevent the test run from being interrupted, all of the safety systems were deliberately switched off. Now, what does that tell you? Okay, there's a problem right there. Human error. And for the test, the reactor had to be powered down to 25% of its capacity. Okay, so they didn't. this didn't go according to plan. And for remember, this is Russia, so there's a lot of information that we don't know that never got out, and a lot of these people aren't alive today to even tell you. So anyway, the procedure didn't go according to plan, and the reactor power levels fell to less than 1%. They were only supposed to go to 25%. They went down to 1%, and so they increased the power. But 30 seconds after the start of the test, something happened, 
It was sudden, it was unexpected, and there was a power surge. Right Now, no one knows why, but the reactor's emergency shutdown procedures, which would have halted the chain reaction, they failed. So there you have some safety measures that were removed, and then you have a mechanical failure that didn't happen. Within fractions of a second, everything changed. Power levels rose, temperature rose, the reactor was out of control in three seconds. Three seconds, you can't react that fast. In three seconds, there was a violent explosion, and a 1,000 ton, you got that? 1,000 ton, that's 2 million pounds, ceiling cap on the reactor building was blown off. That's why there was a hole on the top of the reactor building. The temperatures went over 2,000 degrees Celsius. The fuel rods melted. The graphite coating of the reactor started to burn. Carbon actually started to burn. And so everything was burning. And the products were released, uh, were sucked up into the atmosphere, and then they traveled everywhere. So all these radioactive products were up in the smoke. And it was falling on people. Um, so all of that, you, you saw some of that in the video. All right. Our typical exposure is about 360 millirems per year, and their exposure is 100,000 rems per hour. So remember, these are millirems, so that's less than one rem per year. And they're getting over 100,000 per hour. So the people who were near Chernobyl at that time were getting just an absolutely huge dosage of radioactivity, and they were there for days and didn't know it. Okay, so the accident occurred on the 26th of April in 1986. The power plant settlement was evacuated the following day. But nothing, remember, it's Russia, nothing was reported until the Danish Nuclear Research Lab announced the accident. Now, they announced it with no confirmation from Russia. They went straight on stuff that they had found from seismic data and other uh, things like satellite images and stuff that they had figured it out. The German press announced the accident that were three days later. All right. Now Pripyat's already been evacuated, but other cities nearby had not. In fact, Russia continued doing construction of reactors five and six at Chernobyl for three more years before they actually shut it down. So they didn't realize how bad the people were being irradiated uh, until long later. Chernobyl was finally shut down in December of 2000. Right? Now, you look at what happened in Japan in 2011, it was shut down immediately. Right? So, different, different reactions. Right? These numbers are really made up. No one can really tell you exactly how many men died stopping the radiation, but the estimates are that 25,000 men died either immediately or over the course of weeks or months or a couple of years all right, after the... Um, after trying to stop the radiation, right? And then 70,000 more men, they believe, have died from radiation sickness. Now, they're only dealing with men because the men were the ones who were the first responders. The women were not there. The men were the ones who were, who were cleaning up, okay? Um, if you want to do some research on this, uh, if you get interested in Chernobyl, you ever have to do a report for English or something, or history, this is a, she is a really cool photographer. She's gone out and taken many, many pictures of uh, Chernobyl, and you're going to see a number that are here, uh, which most of them are hers. Uh, here's just a building, and there's a tree growing right in front of it. Well, remember, 20 years ago, uh, this happened in 86, so this is almost 30 years ago now. Um, there are trees springing up. There are vines growing over houses, right, where things are alive. Um, there are lots of things, like this room, for example, which was just completely evacuated. They just ran out. They left. The, obviously, there's still blankets here. Uh, they didn't take anything with them, right? This city is gone. Now, you can see way in the background, you can see Chernobyl. That is Chernobyl back there. But you look at all of these, these are all apartment buildings. Everything that you see is an apartment building, right? So hundreds of thousands of people, and it's a ghost town. There is no one there anymore. Hasn't been, never will be, right? Uh, one of the things that Belarus is known for is they're known as a manufacturing capital for manufacturing trucks. Obviously, they have military equipment here, tanks, military helicopters. They were all left. They can't do anything with them. They can't finish them. They can't go back and get them. The radiation's just too high. They were all just left there. Okay. Plutonium is the most toxic substance we have ever produced. It does not exist in nature. Now, the body treats it like iron. This is where we get into chemistry. The body treats plutonium like iron. 
due to its chemical similarity, meaning it bonds essentially the same way. So it gets, gets distributed by the blood system to feed growing cells. Well, when you have something that's radioactive and it goes to feed growing cells, those cells are affected and tend to, um, uh, tend to mutate. All right, and this is where cancer comes from. So this creates a bunch of cancers and blood disorders. In the Chernobyl Heart movie, you heard about cesium-137, which the body thinks of as potassium. Well, why does it think of it as potassium? Well, again, go to, go to chemistry, look at your periodic table, and you'll see that cesium is directly below potassium on the periodic table. So it bonds in exactly the same way. It concentrates in the muscles, has a half-life of 30 years, so people are getting irradiated for their whole lives by this cesium that they're ingesting. Iodine-131, it's absorbed by the thyroid gland that's in your neck. It cannot determine whether it's natural or radioactive iodine. Your body uh, normally goes and concentrates iodine there, but if there's a lot of radioactive iodine, the radioactive iodine causes cancer and other disorders to the thyroid gland. How about strontium-90? That's another one that is radioactive and the body thinks it's calcium. Again, why? Because strontium is directly below calcium on the periodic table. It gets distributed through the body, can cause leukemia, many other cancers, along with other health problems. So this is why so many people over in that part of the country are so sick. This last thing we're going to do is give you an update on what happened to some of the children that you saw in the film. The roughly handled child that you saw in the film, uh, that child passed away certainly shortly after the film was shot. Uh, Sasha was 13 when the film was made. Remember, it was filmed in 2003. He was malnourished, had a weak immune system. He was treated for scabies, which is what he had. He still has relapses. He has cerebral palsy, but he's doing much, much better. Um, another Sasha, Sasha Levkin, he's now in his 20s. He was 21 in 2011. He asked for a television. He got a television and more. He learned English, and he's now an author. And here's some pictures of him with some of the people who he's worked with. Right? Upon turning 20, um, they built a group home in 2009 and 2010 because the kids were kicked out of, of the uh, home that they were in. It had 10 apartments, one communal living area, and a lot of them are living there now. So you can, for example, you recognize Sasha over here. Uh, so there are a number of them who are now living in uh, that facility. Another Sasha, he wanted to be a doctor, if you remember him. He now has a custom wheelchair. He's been to Ireland multiple times. He turned 21 also in 2011. He is healthy and he's mentally fit. The problem is he's depressed because he can't do what he wants to do, right? But nonetheless, he's reading, leading a full and active life um, from his wheelchair, right? Tatiana, or Tanya, as she was called, um, who had the heart surgery, she's now living a normal, healthy life. Her operation was 100% successful, and she currently visits Ireland with a host family every summer. Uh, the children from there cannot be adopted, so they travel. Uh, they, they are not allowed to go move to another country. Um, so um, they stay there, but they come to visit often. Dr. Novick, he's a plastic surgeon from Memphis. He's married. He has four kids, and he travels to Belarus at least once a year to perform surgery. Uh, for gratis. Okay, and he is on the board of the uh, of the Children's Network. Okay, there was some news in 2011. Uh, Germany is trying to eliminate all nuclear power plants in the next 10 years. That's 20% of their electricity. Switzerland is trying in the next 20 years. That's 50% of their electricity. And France is investigating reducing the nuclear power that they use, which is 80% of their electricity. They're doing this because of not only Chernobyl, but also what happened in Japan. All right, we're done with that. There's no worksheet, but just wanted to give you a sense of what has happened since Chernobyl Heart was filmed. Okay, questions? See us in class. We'll be happy to help. Have a good one. Bye-bye.